In these times of uncertainty, it's all the more important that we keep collaborating, informing and inspiring each other, so that we can be smarter and better tomorrow. Welcome to the Pakhuis de Zwijger livecast. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, this is already the third live cast in part of the Media Architecture Biennale, which will be held in Amsterdam in June 28th until July 2nd. Um, today we have a fantastic lineup with three great speakers from around the globe who are um, here with us via Zoom. Um, and I'm also very proud that we have with us here in the studio Indira. Indira is director of uh, ARCAM, the Architectural Institute here in the city. And as for me, I'm Frank Zuenbroek. I'm a professor of spatial urban transformation here at the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences. And I'm part of the executive committee of the Media Architecture Biennale. Um, well, the central question of today's session will be to search how media architecture can be an agent, can be a means to explore how we can, um, how, how we can find pathways of hope now we see that the post-COVID times might be um, coming rapidly. And actually right now we're in Amsterdam, we're still in a lockdown as many cities probably in the, in the, around the globe as well. And this actually still offers the momentum to take a step back and think what is actually our city? How are we evolving our city? And what are the kind of things we have to address once the COVID time might be over? Um, and how can media architecture help in this? Well, what is media architecture? Media architecture is the emerging discipline on the crossroad of architecture, art, design, new technologies, and the whole digital layer of our city. And what makes it interesting, in, in my perspective, what makes it exciting, is that especially as it is on the crossroad, it can go to the very tangible, like the architecture, the built environment, as well as the more thought area of, of art and design, and see how can we move between them and learn from them. Um, Today, uh, what we have as the central focus for our theme, for our uh, meeting today, is a concept we borrowed from the environment, from environmental psychology, and it's called restorative environments. And what I like about this concept is that the concept actually has a very simple biological um, uh, concept, which says that each organism, each city, needs to restore uh, and recharge regularly. And what this means, as our cities are still in the process of densification, and as we're building more houses within the city, getting more digital tools which influence the way we live, is how can we build in more restorative qualities? And well, this is the central theme. And before we go to the speakers, I want to introduce Indira first and say a warm welcome. Welcome, Thank Indira. Thank you. Um, Indira is uh, director of ARCOM, the uh, Institute for Architecture, Landscape Architecture and Urban Design in Amsterdam. And of course, as a center, you're in the midst of all the debates and all the plans and all the ideas of the city, of, of the way we develop. Um, so it's great that you are willing to, to respond and reflect on the kind of discussions that we will have here. Well, as a first starting point, can you may, maybe say something about what are the kind of themes that you are taking up in the center? And as a second question, well, if we consider the Govit area as a natural experiment, and a, a, a not planned natural experiment. What do we take from it? What are your observations? Well, thank you, Frank, for, for having me. It's a, really a pleasure to be here. Um, the Amsterdam Architecture Center is indeed looking to all the ways in which people live in the city, work in the city, move in the city. So we address questions like housing um, um, issues, uh, both on quality or on quantity or sustainability. It can be about uh, energy or climate issues. It can be about uh, social aspects of living in, in a fair city, in an equal city, an accessible city. So um, what we do basically is organize excursions, debates, but also exhibitions, uh, which address to the various uh, topics in Amsterdam and its region. And as Amsterdam, of course, we like to think of as a very, very big city. We think that all the issues that we address are also somehow important to any other city worldwide. <laughs> so then to address your second question, what happens uh, uh, after COVID or what can we take from this time? Um, 
what I like about the concept of, of, of media architecture is, is that it, uh, it's much more flexible, much more versatile than the solid architecture or town planning or uh, landscape architecture, which of course it's much more fixed in time. And uh, uh, media architecture gives us the opportunity to, 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 to respond and to play. And maybe also, uh, as you mentioned, in restorative environments, uh, places to, to relax, but maybe also to... Um, uh, to be surprised and to be entertained. So uh, for me, it's very interesting to, to, to look into the, the area of media architecture to see what long-term lessons we can learn into the city design issues. And COVID-wise, I would say that uh, what we learned maybe most is that uh, uh, it has um, put much more uh, into context, the urgence of, of having good quality outdoor space, of having a sustainable space, of having places to interact, but on a safe level of distance. And um, maybe also to be, be an individual in the city if we cannot be a group. So uh, that's, those are issues in, in, in architecture and, and, and urban landscaping, but, but uh, also, of course, to, to, tonight. So that's really interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you. Great. And thanks for breaking the ice of the discussion already. Um, what we would like to do is go to the first presenter. The first presenter is unfortunately not joining us live. It's uh, Usman Haag. He is living in London, but right now he is in Singapore. So the time difference in that case was a little bit too unfortunate. Um, well, Usman is founding partner and creative director of Umbrellium and engaged in uh, urban technologies that support, that support citizen empowerment and high impact engagement in cities. Uh, also, he was the founder of Thingsful.net, which is a uh, search engine for the Internet of Things. Um, and as he is trained as an architect, as well as engaged in, uh, in, in the whole informatics of the city and, and, and the way technology is go playing out there, um, he's a great start of this, of this conversation. Um, well, and as he couldn't join, we had a conversation with him uh, earlier this week, and this is what he said. Well, thank you very much for having me uh, to talk about this, and I'm sorry I can't be there live on the day, but uh, uh, thank you, Frank, for this conversation today. Um, what I wanted to do was actually pick up from uh, where I left off back in 2018 when I spoke at MAB uh, about engaging cities. And I want to talk about um, wild cities, which is something I'm starting to work on uh, this year. Uh, when, when I um, uh, spoke at MAB in 2018, I talked about three things. One was this idea of designing urban systems to increase the number of decisions that people uh, are part of. And I was talking about how actually it's the quantity, not necessarily the quality of decisions that's important. So rather than just having a referendum on one contentious topic, actually getting people involved in lots of different micro decisions, potentially even things that seem trivial, is actually key to building engagement and participatory systems. The second thing I talked about was uh, as a designer approaching uh, the future, for me, it's important to recognize that I don't hold any key to, to, to the future. I don't necessarily have any insight into that future, but I'm interested to build things that enable others to imagine what that future might be and to do that together and to, to sort of enable us to collectively start to define what the future might look like. And the third thing was this idea of connecting people together so that they do stuff together and achieve something that they don't necessarily think they could manage on their own. And in my experience, this has kind of shown that people tend to have more responsibility then for, for, for what they're participating in. And it tends to have the kind of impact that they actually would like to have and, and, and measure it in the way that they want to. So I'm going to talk about two projects just very briefly that, that have kind of springboarded off of that. I had, um, uh, the first one is called Starling, and I'd shown some of this um, in 2018, which was an interactive and dynamic road surface that we created in South London, where essentially we were trying to build a road that responded to people first rather than vehicles. And we were focusing on the pedestrian crossing as an intersection point between um, humans and machines, if you like. And so we ended up creating this road surface that was able to dynamically adapt to the way that people use the street 
and change size and orientation based on basically what, what was uh, the safest configuration or different times of the day to appear in different locations based on the way the street is changing and, and constantly used in different ways. Um, and we built this essentially as a kind of a, a proof of concept uh, for a dynamic and adaptive street that can actually be built now um, and is not some kind of uh, a far off futuristic thing. And what that has led to is that we've created, uh, we, we actually spun out uh, as a separate um, endeavor, something called Starlink Technologies, with this mission to focus on intersections, junctions, uh, and streets and designing dynamic safety systems for those streets. Now, in, in a kind of a post pandemic, or actually we're, I think, you know, uh, clearly we're still in that pandemic. Um, but what we've seen over the last year is how important pedestrian friendly cities are and how much importance actually local authorities around the world are placing on making sure that the environments are actually uh, welcoming to, to, to humans, if you like, uh, and not just vehicles, which is where, the way that many cities seem to have been designed over the last few decades. And so what we've been concentrating on is designing these systems so that, um, so that in, uh, in a very complex urban environment, where there are now there are multiple different types of mobility systems in a way that there weren't say 20 years ago, 20, 30 years ago. Now we have not just vehicles, cycle lanes, bus lanes. Um, we also have ride share vehicles. We have increasingly uh, uh, expected to have more autonomous vehicles, potentially uh, um, uh, delivery bots, drones, and so on and so forth. And basically we're looking to kind of improve the safety mechanisms uh, for, for kind of, um, managing that, the overlapping of all of that. Uh, you know, we, there's this kind of expectation that once there is full autonomy in the streets, that these streets will be safer. But even if that is true, which I'm, I'm kind of skeptical of, um, but even if that's true, that's still at least 15, 20 years off. And so this next 20 years is one of the most chaotic from the perspective of people who are kind of interacting in the streets. Um, and so we're basically trying to design uh, systems that enable these streets to adapt, to change dynamic signaling uh, in response to all of these kind of overlapping mobility systems. Another thing that's come up uh, just in the last year uh, is, of course, a need to move beyond tactile and touch-based interaction in the city. And so another aspect of this is looking at gesture-based interaction with, with uh, urban systems. So not just pressing a button to cross uh, to cross the road, but potentially using um, uh, gesture to, to indicate it. I'm just going to give a, a little teaser, a video of, of some of the stuff that we're doing in some public roads. Um, this is just a few seconds to show some of the systems live um, uh, on streets and, and kind of uh, controlling some of the urban infrastructure. So that's, that's one project. And really that project is, is, is quite, firmly technologically driven. The other project that I want to talk about, uh, and this is actually the one that I'm spending the most amount of time on, uh, is it's based in London and it's all about participatory urban wilding. I can't talk a huge, huge amount about the detail of this um, because it's still in development, um, but it's essentially a 10 year program to look at introducing natural systems back into the urban environment in a way that actually involves many different communities um, in, in a variety of, uh, of ways. Now, if you look at London um, from a satellite perspective, uh, you see that it looks almost like a, a, a concrete car park in the middle of a sea of green. Um, and even as you kind of zoom in, and, and London is known as, as a very green city. It's, um, you know, it's, got, it's known for its parks and things. It's still really, you can tell that it's been plastered like concrete across the natural environment. Now, for various reasons, a lot of people, a lot of organizations are starting to look at introducing natural systems back into cities as a way to deal with the climate emergency. I'm not going to get into now why that's the case. I think, I think that, that, that there's a lot of discussion about that. But I want to talk about a little bit about the program uh, that, that I'm starting to look at in this project and some of the challenges that can actually arise uh, from that. Um, the, the program itself has four key elements. 
The first is this idea of a, a whole set of community initiatives that are going to get different organizations and communities involved in different ways with uh, re, uh, redesigning growing processes, nurturing, eating, food systems, and so on and so forth. Uh, there's a second element, which is all about the uh, transforming the landscape. So actually greening the landscape, improving biodiversity, pollinators, and, uh, and dealing, of course, with, with water-based ecosystems. The third element is all about transforming the built environment. And this is about actually designing architectural systems that connect human, urban, and natural systems. And then the final one is the digital infrastructure, which is really about creating a network that, that corresponds to the ecosystem network that enables us to provide, if you like, almost like context and history to all of the natural systems that are going to be introduced back into the city. Um, the challenges that I just want to finish with uh, in dealing with these kind of things. And, and this is, I think, a, an imperative that comes about when one is dealing with something as transformative as responding to the climate emergency uh, it, uh, are fourfold. The first thing is that we're having to redesign infrastructure that has been around for decades and that is uh, based on a specific way of building, of deploying, of maintaining, of, and even of procuring. That's one challenge. The second is that when we're talking about things that are actually going to change the way that people relate to each other, their homes, their cities, and so on and so forth, actually redefining how decision making is going to take place, you know, things that are really going to affect people deeply, they have to be part of uh, that process. And so the very governance of this has to be um, uh, designed. Uh, the third is that actually there's a very diverse cultural response to the idea of green cities. You know, there might be some people who would think, oh, you know, it's so lovely to put a wild meadow into the middle of a city. But other people will look at that and think that that's something that somebody's stopped maintaining, that they're paying taxes, but nobody's taking care of that park anymore. And you need to be able to navigate this very complex, diverse cultural experience of, of green in cities in, if, if you're going to build a kind of participatory system. And then the final thing is that this is not just about bringing wild things into the city, but it's also about transforming the way we interact ourselves with those. We basically have to become a, a little bit wild ourselves to embrace that side, that unpredictability, that kind of, uh, if you like, that almost messiness uh, in, in terms of our interactions with, with the city and, and with each other. And on that, I'm going to uh, wrap up. Thank you. Wild cities. I actually see dramatic effects on all aspects. In fact, this project be began before uh, the pandemic, and so it did predate it, but it's had to change for various reasons. The first is that actually, clearly for the last year, most people are simply concerned about their own individual personal health, primarily. You know, that's become absolutely imperative. And, and worrying about things like air quality um, have kind of almost fall into, into the second place. So we've had to be quite conscious of framing this within an understanding that actually our personal health actually is directly connected to how we interact with natural systems. The second thing that, that's kind of, you know, been, been quite, a, had quite an impact is actually in how we just relate to our city, you know, almost balancing what I just said there has been this kind of recognition, I think, in people that actually they want the outdoors to be welcoming and to be, you know, not just uh, another version of an indoor room with hard surfaces and kind of surrounding them, you know, actually finding um, more welcoming ways for the, for the urban environment to, to enable not just walking around, but play to enable, you know, child-friendly cities, to enable, um, uh, you know, even us to, to be able to do work outdoors. You know, the, 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 this is not just about leisure activity. Um, uh, and the third thing is that I think that we've realized that as the, for example, the, the decrease in traffic has, in some cases, um, resulted in to a, quite a dramatic shift in improving the air quality, even if it was only temporary. And I think that's really clicked in people's minds that, oh, actually, that's how quickly we could change our city. You know, within the space of a couple of months, if we were able to deal with the traffic 
pollution issue, we can actually start to have a tangible impact uh, you know, almost immediately. And so all of those things have kind of fed into how we have been planning out the project. Well, thank you, uh, Osman, um, um, if you're watching this later on, uh, for contributing. Um, well, he has a lot of stories to tell uh, in DIRA, uh, different kind of projects. Uh, uh, what, what is your first um, reflection on this, if, if you look at it from um, a restorative environment as well? Uh, well, it, it, it is a, a very inspiring talk. You can obviously see how he is a former architect, can't you? Like how he's uh, connecting to the city and the city systems and also the design aspects of that. And uh, I, I found it in, inspiring to see how he engages with the environment, but also how he makes sure that people engage with each other. And maybe that's something that in post-COVID times we might have to relearn again to actually engage with each other. And I remember this uh, project he did I think about to in 2012 or something in, in Eindhoven, Marling, where he had this this ceiling of, of, of light beams where you, that you could play with, but just by reaching out and making movements and how funny and how much fun the, the, the city looked like. And uh, at the same time, it's of course very uh, pragmatic and very functional, the things he, is, uh, he, he proposes for the, the, the crossing, for example. And um, I think that might be very inspiring also in, in, in designing issues that are now uh, 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 topical in, in, in Amsterdam. Um, the design of, of, of safe spaces and, desi and designing within the, 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 the consciousness of that, that there are so many people that have a right to claim space that uh, they cannot always claim. This could be uh, gender-based or color-based, but also age-based or ability-based. And it also can depend on location or the time of the day. And uh, his design, uh, uh, the impact of, of his design proposals can very much play and improve the city for the various users of the city. So I like that a lot. Yeah, yeah, make the city more responsive, so to say. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And to, to different needs also yeah, exactly. at the same time. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, now we go to the, the next speakers. We, um, we will have um, Maria and, and Ben uh, quite shortly after each other. Um, and then we have time for a wider discussion. And that also counts for the viewers. So um, if you're uh, willing or have some questions, please put them in the chat. Um, well, now I would like to welcome uh, Maria. Maria, welcome. It's great you're here. Um, good to have you here. Um, you are Maria Ayolova. You are now um, connected to us via Zoom, of course, from New York. You're an educator, uh, designer, community builder in New York City. You were the university leader for Arab for two years, if I'm uh, pronouncing that correctly. Um, and what's already uh, what's what's really exciting is that you're also um, experimenting with ecological design or design for life, as you call it. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hear your um, story. So um, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for the invitation. I'm really excited to be here, and I look forward to the discussion. Too bad Usman is not here to talk to us, and you'll see why in a minute. But I want to start with the title of my talk, which is Design with Life. And this is actually the cover of our book uh, that was published last year uh, by Actor. And Terraform One, it's a nonprofit design group in Brooklyn, New York. And our mission is to design so we can prevent extinction of all species, including humans. So I'll define biodesign as the field of design that incorporates living organisms as an essential component, enhancing the function of the finished work. And today I want to tell you about the Monarch Sanctuary. This will be an eight-story commercial building in Nolita, New York. For those of you who don't know where Nolita is, it stands for North of Little Italy. 
and it's a neighborhood in Manhattan. And in fact, uh, it's where I live. My apartment is right around the corner. So this is this building, in addition to housing commercial spaces and offices, will also provide a habitat for the monarch butterfly, for breeding grounds, habitat, and a way station. The monarch butterflies are in danger in North America. In fact, there is a discussion if they should be put on the list of endangered species and given this status. And this is due to the fact that every year, all the monarch butterflies from the whole continent migrate to this specific uh, place in Mexico. But today, many of them don't make it. They die in a way. And this is caused by pesticides from agriculture, but also based on habitat uh, loss because of climate change. So what we are proposing with this pioneering building called the Monarch Sanctuary, it's to provide a habitat that supports all stages of life of the monarch butterflies. This is, so we are going to house this habitat in the facade of the building using a double skin facade. This is not an envelope design, however. This is proposing a new paradigm of a building where we create a new biome that is balancing the habitat of humans, plants, and butterflies. New studies indicate that the building microbiome is essential for human health. And what we want to achieve here is to create a new notion where it goes against kind of the current uh, idea of isolation and sterility. And then that's what people believe that's the way we uh, should build in a post COVID world. In fact, we are proposing the opposite. We think by creating a biodiverse micro biome in the building, you basically, what we can achieve to have the quality of the outdoors brought indoors. And so this is a porous building that uh, basically balances the human habitat and the natural habitat. And uh, we think um, that we can then support uh, the monarch's population in two different ways. On the roof, there will be an actual roof garden with milkweeds and other plants that uh, the wild butterflies can uh, feed on. And then inside uh, the facade, we will basically uh, have a breeding places and grow monarch butterflies that will be able to rejoin the wild population. And uh, this is going to be the facade both the, for the people who occupy the buildings, but also for the passerbys in New York to observe. And we built a full scale prototype, a piece of this facade in, uh, this is an exhibition in the Cooper Hewitt, the Smithsonian Museum of Design in New York City. Uh, this was uh, commissioned uh, by the museum for their nature triennial in 2019. And I'm, here's a picture of me for scale, but we wanted to prove how we can basically integrate these new types of green technologies together with butterflies feeders that we designed and really have uh, this habitat where we can uh, prove that we can support uh, the monarch butterflies, but at the same time, think about how this can become a part of a building system. And here is a very brief and a little bit of a choppy video uh, of how uh, the monarchs are here inside the museum in their new habitat. And uh, here's another one, uh, very briefly. And while we don't think we'll be able to save the monarch butterflies with this one building in New York City, we think it provides an object lesson of what is possible if we think of how we can design 
not just for human, but for all species. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, for this uh, great presentation and, and fantastic project that you showed us. Um, and it's great to see that you actually bring in the, the species, uh, well, you, you, the ambitions of, 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 your, of Terraform are, of course, huge, that you want to save any organism for extinction. So I like that you now address also for the use of the, of the city, that it's also a part for different species who are, well, uh, maybe in, uh, in risk of extinction and so on, and maybe on a more abstract level are almost like uh, countering the classic dichotomy between urban and rural, which is normally played out on the level of the ur urban fringe. But now you make this porous, what you say about the, the skin, also on the level of the city, that it's nature bringing in the city is, um, uh, is not something which is outside the city, but can be in the city. So it's a great, a great presentation. Um, Indira, um, what is your first reflection on, uh, on, on, on what Maria has told us? Well, 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 first of all, that if we would design our buildings like that uh, in a usual way, as, as, as a kind of matter of fact thing, that how 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 much uh, more uh, um, uh, fun and, uh, uh, and adventurous the city would look like, because it gives the opportunity to so many new forms and 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 and, and, and textiles and uh, textures uh, of, of facades, which is really really a very rich addi addition to the city, I'd say. And, and at the same time, it, it, it makes me think on uh, what would happen if we would to take that, be able to, to take that one step further, if we would really uh, decide to live together with all these different species that are inside and outside the city. And, and if they would use the city as, 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 as we do, as kind of a proper inhabitants of the city. And uh, so I, I thought about what kind of uh, species we have in Amsterdam that are kind of extinct or that have uh, uh, difficulties in surviving. And one of them is, is the eel. And there is actually a, a very, very interesting project that, that is, is, is looking on ways to represent the eel as a citizen of the, uh, of the city of Amsterdam. And how, what would he need politically to make known what his specific wishes are? How can he survive? How can he eat? How can he relax in the city? Or how can he move through the city? So that, that's really interesting. And then, if we would take that one step further, uh, would we um, uh, be prepared to, to, to sacrifice some of our own uh, 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 habits in the city? Would we, for example, um, um, be prepared to, 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 to bring down the level of noise in the city so that uh, birds can communicate better, so that they are, have better ways of staying and existing in the city? Or would we... Um, Except that uh, the street will be dark uh, when the when darkness naturally comes into the city, so that there is much more time to to restore and to recharge uh, for animals and humans alike. So it's really very in adventurous uh, and uh, interesting to think about. All right. Well, uh, enough. <laughs> of, I, I don't know if you've been writing, Maria, but enough <laughs> questions for later on. First, uh, I want to introduce uh, Ben. Uh, ben Hooker is our next and final pres presenter, uh, live from, I suppose, LA, or is it Pasadena? Um, LA. LA. <laughs> Welcome, Ben. Uh, ben is a, a multimedia designer, artist, and educator um, who exhibits and teaches internationally. Um, you're a co core faculty member of the uh, Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, and as well as practicing uh, your own uh, design uh, 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 research. Um, and what I like about your work and, and, and what you might present is that rather than consisting of author stories of entirely top-down designed worlds, um, you're exploring how multimedia and computational sketching are a sort of testing ground which touches on reality but not necessarily acts on reality. It's not necessarily a representation but like a thought, a, a drawn a thought experiment. And, and what I like as well is that you say that the future of the city and the electronically mediated life, you don't approach it like uh, neither from a very cynical dystopical future, which might be something if we think along what technology and holds for us, but you also not naively booster it like the old days of the smart city. So uh, Ben, um, take it away. Thank you. I will uh, uh, share my screen. 
Uh, yes, yeah, so thank you for the opportunity to contribute. I have to say, I find I'm in, very intimidated by the question, like post COVID, like the design challenge. And um, as Frank was saying, uh, yeah, I'm not a, 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 an urban planner or an architect. I'm um, uh, an interactive uh, a designer, but I hope that I can, in some way, the work will contribute to the discussion. And before I, I wanted to sort of go quickly through a, a, a few projects and, um, one of the things that uh, uh, the work I do, it, it's not meant to be interpreted literally as a design proposal. It's more about um, question finding. And I think I'm kind of searching for what the new brief is, because it seems that the brief we have at the moment is actually not really aligned with the reality of the sort of the augmented, algorithmically orchestrated lives that many of us lead. Um, uh, and so I wanted to start, this is um, some pages from a recent um, sketchbook called Image Object Landscape Event. And uh, the idea is there's no really, no singular overarching concept other than this love-hate relationship that I, and I guess other people in this call have with kind of screens and media and technology. And, um, and, uh, and the idea is that by collecting, by collaging um, different kinds of representation of um, media and, and physical structure, the, there's sort of flattening the hierarchy between um, you know, what is actually uh, built and what, is, uh, and what is media. And so sketching, I'll, I'll just step through this quickly. Sketching is sort of an important part of my um, process because I, I sort of think that new ideas about um, how we live in mixed reality environments, how we engage and disengage from virtual worlds and the, the part that plays in kind of like a restorative experience or a stimulating every experience, we need like new ideas need new communicative techniques. And so uh, that's sort of um, something that I, I try to explore in, in a very sort of um, open-ended way. Um, and, and I guess, as I'm sort of putting these things together, I, I start to just sort of collect things and collage them and sort of bits of story emerge from the collage. And so it's sort of an anti top down way of thinking. It's sort of an imprecise, um, sorry, an unfinished but precise kind of world building. Um, so I just wanted to step through that first. And then I wanted to move on to share um, another project. We're in a similar vein, but it, it has more specific uh, design ideas. Uh, so shown on screen is the kind of images you you see if you kind of Google smart city. And um, I'll just step through these kind of sort of what what a, uh, th this notion of a smart city, you know, as a hermetically sealed world where we can control everything with an app. Um, and obviously, these images are very easy to mock, right. Um, uh, but I but I just show them because um, I think uh, Another question that I'm interested in asking, and it sounds like a very stupid question, but I think it's actually a very hard question, is like, well, what, what is a city? I mean, we've, we maybe see places which look like cities, but they don't feel like cities. They're not sort of a, you know, as a city is a place where you encounter, a, a city is a space of learning or, or kind of a, um, where you encounter people that are, have, are, are different to yourself. Or, um, and, and so I'm interested in kind of uh, challenging um, what happens when sort of technologies of the smart city smash with kind of uh, collide with kind of culture and sort of and what what happens? And so um, uh, a project I, uh, with a, a couple of collaborators. So I should say mo nearly everything I do is is in collaboration with um, uh, with one or two other people. Um, I'm, my background is screen based design, but. Uh, the, uh, a more kind of um, uh, spatial spatial design. This was a, a series of short films called Everything on Time. And the idea is that each, there's five acts in, these, in this film and each, each piece provides acts as a kind of a, a brief. Um, so this first, uh, the first film, these are just um, excerpts, is all about how we share our life with autonomous devices and the sort of the inconvenient truths um, uh, the, uh, about them, so things like you know battery battery life and and kind of power failure and, and the debris of kind of micro machines and servicing them. And this next uh, 
uh, sequence is uh, about sort of the camera infrastructure and uh, the idea of the, the, the infrastructure, the media infrastructure is deliberately um, uh, inelegant and unwieldy and how like the infrastructure starts to become like a protagonist in 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 our everyday life and we kind of change our behavior as we like, move around kind of um, different kinds of sensing um, infrastructures. Uh, this sequence is all about uh, the acceleration of online online transactions impacting the physical city. So there was a, a news story that we were really attracted to, which was um, uh, uh, YouTube has a recording studio um, in, in Los Angeles. And if you have a certain number of followers, you can get access to this recording studio. So there's a very direct relationship between the number of like social media capital, literally unlocking a door in, in the city. And so this, and so with these, with these, these projects, we're trying to sort of amplify that idea. So here, there are these kind of um, enigmatic social media transactions that are resulting in transformation in the urban in the urban fabric and we're sort of amplifying that. And then this last um, uh, sequence is about um, designing the designing what has been to this point undesignable. So um, uh, you know, sort of programming, um, programming things which we thought of as being sort of natural, natural systems. And um, uh, for this project, we interviewed, we interviewed people who designed weather for, for virtual environments. And so we conducted these interviews with weather designers and then superimposed them on this sequence of like simulated, um, exaggerated, uh, um, like uh, domestic gardens that are somehow algorithmically controlled. Um, and then this final sequence, which we call the logistical Baroque, it's, it's thinking about sort of a time of post-optimization, you know, sort of for the privileged few, you know, the city can be thought of as a machine where you can have exactly what you want, when you want, and then, and sort of, so what's next? So this idea that logistics stuff where starts, logistics starts to have like an ornamentation in it and sort of the, the actual, the, the, the character of the, of, um, of sort of infrastructure and logistics starts to have this, uh, you know, Baroque, um, form to it. And so, um, yeah, this idea that these, the, the sort, it's sort of world building, but unfinished, and um, uh, that the, the, each of these sequences is meant to be like a question finding, a brief, you know, for kind of like, uh, that, that will um, lead to more applied projects. And I have a few other slides, but I think that's eight minutes now. So I think I'll just, I'll just stop there. Thanks. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ben. Um, you took us on a, on a wild ride uh, among many um, projects and, um, and, and, and very interesting points. I think you touched on many interesting points. My, my main takeaway is the city not as a machine or like the anti-machine on the city by representing that you superimpose um, on the natural world what they should do as, um, as a sort of, a, 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 um, well, more, more of a radical representation of, of, of how we normally try to influence the city. Um, well, let's take a look at Indira. Indira, <laughs> uh, we now have the time to discuss with Ben and Maria. Uh, what they have presented and take also into account what, uh, what Usman said. Maybe your first response on, uh, on, on, on Ben, because it was a whole different take than what we saw from Maria. Um, but what are the first thoughts you have? Yeah, well, the, the, the bed puzzles me. And it also makes me think on um, that, that, that media architecture and, 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 and design may also offer ways to 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 take refuge in the city to 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 dis to disengage and to maybe to shut down like is there a way to escape from all these um uh, systems and uh, data and uh, incentives that take place around us so uh, uh, i don't know if you want me to ask a question to ben but yeah, but that that would that would be my first question is um, yeah. Can can your work help us to disengage from from all these stimuli that are around us? 
I mean, Inter, I think the, this idea that people are kind of multifaceted, right, and, and, and irrational and complicated. And so um, uh, I think there's a case for sometimes, you know, the city can be, there's a, it is desirable to be overwhelmed, right, sometimes. Uh, but but to your point, but at the same time, we need to be able to, it's, it's this inability to control our environment that leads to stress. And, and so um, I, I, uh, I don't, I, uh, I have other projects that specifically play with that polarity, sort of the old, sort of the, the, the changing the gradient of kind of engagement to this overwhelming, like, uh, very like fractured and, and la fractal and layered kind of um, information overload. And I, and I try to sort of advocate for there's a value for being open to that, you know, to be, to be that feeling of being overwhelmed and stimulated is exciting and can be, can be restorative if it's partnered with this ability to, to, to sort of back away from that, I think. Um, and so, yes, I, 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 uh, I, I very much kind of uh, um, appreciate the question and that's something that maybe is not communicated by this kind of overload of slides, but that's something that I take very seriously uh, as, as kind of a, as part of a brief. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Ben. Um, uh, I, I think what would be interesting if we have, a, have a, um, engaged in a discussion with Maria as well, because um, you have been presenting but, but not able to react to some of the remarks we gave. Um, I, I think the, the first question which I would like to pose is one of the things which you hear a lot about, um, normally about circular development or energy transition or any given transformation that we need to make through in the city, is that it needs to scale up at some point, um, right? That's still the, the natural order that we see a lot outdoors. And I'm wondering if you talk about your building um, and, you, and you would zoom out and think on the street or think on the rhythm of the street, and I think Andrea called it fun and call it like the skin of the buildings are, are suddenly acting, interacting with us in a different way. What are your thoughts on that? How do you take it from there, from one building? What's next? In relationship to the energy supply or? No, 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 in relation to the greening of the city that you do, the, 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 the uh, providing place for the endangered species. Right. Uh, so uh, our belief uh, uh, at Terraform One is, is that uh, we are trying to basically build the urban ecology where it, there is a space for all the species, uh, not just humans. And in, in fact, the uh, ecology doesn't stop at the edge of the city. There is very rich um, habitat that exists through the city, but seeking the balance and how it's interconnected and that porosity that I talked about between buildings, streets, parks, rooftops, rivers, uh, and, and, and then understanding how they interact and then using new technologies, both from you know, new types of materials, but also new, how do we uh, think about like data and, and then to, to uh, create this new type of balance that we uh, want to have in, in cities and allowing actually habitat for more species to uh, return to the city. And just as a follow-up question uh, before I go to Idira, uh, is, is, is what would this mean from the perspective of the human being in the street? If you, if you have multiple buildings like this, what, what are your thoughts on that? I think the experience will be like Alice in Wonderland, right? I mean, imagine walking down the street and, and you pause and, 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 and look at this, uh, you know, facade of, of, of uh, butterflies and, and, and flowers and, and, and have kind of the, the sense of, of, of uh, this is a part of your ecosystem um, and, and uh, also kind of exposes uh, this kind of the, both the fragility, but the sense of hope that, that this could be preserved uh, for uh, the uh, future generation. And I should say that at Terraform One, we are um, a perpetual optimists, right? All our designs are really kind of looking uh, into the future to show you what is possible. And 
I am personally kind of, uh, really in a good place these days by thinking about all the the youth climate activists uh, that are coming now from around the world, these children that are suing their governments and asking them, we need to assure that our future will be possible and you're ruining it for us. And, and in fact, uh, there is this uh, 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 an old Native American law that it's called the seventh generation law that anything you do, you have to assure that it will be sustainable for seven generations in the future. So, sorry, that was a long answer of your question, but I, I think uh, it, if I, I see that kind of that new paradigm that is shifting and it's coming from really young children, as young as seven years old that are part of this movement. All right, great. Um... Yeah, Maria, I, I like that that, that that you mentioned that. I was thinking back to what Usman uh, presented uh, at the beginning of uh, of this program, um, when he presented the engaging cities and, and, and wild cities and how he almost formulated an agenda of what would be necessary. And one of them would be to increase the number of decisions and the other one would be to create shared memories. And I was wondering if... If there is, uh, if, the, if you see connection between uh, the work you do and, and the effect it has on the street, and if there is a, if it also makes it possible to to create interaction between people and users and and create memories of it. Yes, absolutely. And as I said, too bad uh, Usman is not here to talk to us because I was really fascinated with kind of that the, the notion of uh, urban wilding that he talked about. And I think, um, you know, the, the, it's important to have this engagement of, of uh, everyone, right? That it's participates in urban life. So in, we have this notion that uh, in a kind of a new profession that we call urbaneers, these are kind of urban pioneers that are responsible for creating the future city, but it should be everyone, not just planners and architects and designers, but a teacher, a chef, a fireman, they're, they're all urbaneers because we live together in the city. And in fact, um, you know, this, uh, kind of the, 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 not just the decision-making process, but the, 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 actually the action of design should involve the larger community. And, and in New York, that's kind of part of, of, of the process which can get uh, you know, really hard and, 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 and long in some cases through, through community engagement, but we already have you know, a, a good precedent uh, with uh, um, Rebuild by Design was kind of after Hurricane Sandy that was uh, uh, established as a process that the, everybody should be, at the, the community should be at the table at day one when you start designing, not just go and present the finished design. So, and, and, and for us uh, at Terraform One, we go beyond that. We, have, we are designing for other species. I mean, uh, we build a cricket shelter and we lived with crickets uh, for almost a year, right? And then we wanted to design the best shelter for these other species. So it, 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 it takes, it's about developing this different uh, sensibility and kind of understanding how uh, we are all part of the same ecosystem and you should kind of try to find the balance and the right design. And, and, and do you think this, this, uh, this, this life and this species that you um, uh, involve in your design making, do they um, simply take up space that, that's, that's already there? Or do we as humans uh, uh, need to be... Uh, well, to, 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 to take back a little, to, 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 to give back a little, to take up a little less space and to sacrifice some? Or do you think that that's, that that's not necessary? Well, I don't know about humans, but uh, <laughs> cars definitely can, you know, give back a little or a lot. Yeah. And, and what we've experienced um, in cities around the world uh, during COVID, there are no cars in the streets and we've <laughs> taken over streets for restaurants, for fairs, for playgrounds. And I sincerely hope that uh, this notion is here to stay. And I think that's how we can create more room for all these other species that we want to <laughs> reintroduce to our cities. Yeah, can I tie into this, this idea of other species? Because um, 
uh, actually what, what Ben was to telling us and what, what, what came in my mind is actually, uh, Ben, that you told about, um, you, you said, for who is the city? And then you showed us drones and the IE and so on. So I'm thinking uh, uh, Maria is introducing again more uh, all, all, all sorts of organisms back in the city biologically. Are you also introducing the idea that we might also th should think about inhabitants of the city from, uh, well, how should I say, synthetical perspective? Uh, I mean, that's, I think that's interesting. I mean, just the question about, I mean, it came up in the, in the, two, the other two presentations about um, uh, it's what is um, natural, Right. I mean, I think some of these, what is nature? And, and mm -hmm. some of these words, I think, are, you know, something can look wild, but it's not, but it's not kind of biologically wild, you know? And so I think in, I see a connection to sort of the, some of the things that I'm playing with, with sort of the collage and the simulation in that some, you know, uh, you know, we'll, we'll use a term like, you know, to make, to, to, to make something wild, but it might look visually very sort of tangled or disorganized, but it kind of actually, it's, it's not, it's not kind of wild biologically or something can look very to, to our eyes, maybe looks very um, unwelcoming, austere, but is in, is sort of much more biologically sort of diverse. Right. And so I think that's, in, that, that's interesting, but yes, Frank, to your question, this, um, the, the projects actually that we're working on for the, for the media architecture Biennale is all about, um, how sort of coexistence with um, different sort of um, uh, nebulous entities that are involve um, uh, sort of learning and um, uh, an intelligence and sort of how that might change the, the the character of the of the street. You know what? So I think a lot of what I'm interested in is is sort of the is like the emotional space that results when we're kind of adding more. Um, sort of automation, intelligence, media um, to, uh, to, to sort of the, the urban fabric um, uh, and sort of, you know, so it, like, what, if, what will it feel like? Um, and uh, for me, is that's an important, important question. And, and sort of, so the, bio, the, the sort of the, the, the non-human elements of that um, is a really important part of that. Well, thank you. That's um, unfortunately we're almost running out of time. Um, I, I want to all three of you. What should we take from the lessons from our uh, like standstill during COVID? And of course, we just have a very short time of answer for each of you. Maria, what what do you take with us? With you, what should we take with us from COVID times? Well, I'm going to borrow a line from uh, Dalai Lama. I was privileged uh, just a couple of weeks ago to be part of a kind of a small group presentation where he talked to a group of Harvard students and as an alumni, I was invited. And, but he said it best. He said, today and after COVID, we cannot think about my country anymore. We have to say my planet. All right. That's, an, uh, that's a good one. Uh, that's a very uh, deep one already. Ben, what do, what do you say? What, what did you take from the COVID times? What There's nothing. I can't, I can't compete with that, but I'll offer my... my uh, so, I mean, well, I, the one thing is just that for us, uh, you know, the, the privilege of being able to change the way we work. Uh, so just being aware that, like, you know, um, for, it's an inconvenience for many of us that we, we have to be remote, but for many people that's not... That, that that sort of um, option is not there, but it is. It has been interesting to have to kind of practice what you preach a bit, you know. So this idea of kind of telepresence, of kind of virtual connection, has been around for so long, but now it's kind of we're really having to eat it, you know. <laughs> and I think that's sort of useful, albeit some not a happy time, but it's a useful experience to have to, to sort of um, practice what we have that has been preached about all this virtual. Hangout activity. Yeah. All right. Well, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a tougher, a tougher uh, variant. Um, uh, Indira, what what is your final thoughts on what we should take with us? <laughs> well, obviously, uh, many things have been said and very very sensible things too. But um, uh, I think th three things st stuck in my mind. I think the 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 importance to be able to to rescale and to find flexible skills in the city for different needs. And different demands of the city. That, that's what I find found really really interesting from uh, 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 Usman's presentation. 
and, and also the notion that we can take back the city by increasing the number of decisions we can make that would make us help ad adapt to the city or own the city maybe in a, in a more um, um, satisfying way. And, uh, and, 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 and I totally agree with Mariah and the Dalai Lama that, that be a design and living with nature, of course, is, is, is very, very important. And I do think it does need uh, adaptation also from humans, but I totally agree. Let's start with the cars. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm afraid time is up. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, Indira, for being You're here. Uh, Maria from New York, uh, Ben from LA, and uh, Usman. Uh, thanks again. If you if you, if we record this back, if you look this back. Um, well, thank you. This was the third edition of the live cast in the, in the, for the Media Architecture Biennale. Again, it will be uh, the Biennale here at the 27th or 28th of June. And we will have a fourth uh, live cast uh, soon. Um, please take a look at our website, www.mab20.org. Thank you. Stay safe.